the initiative. But I must say I'm quite overwhelmed by this huge number of about 1,000 registrants from various parts of the world. And I think the enormous interest in this scientific meeting reflects not only the general interest in that topic. I think it also reflects the need to move forward in battery research and technology. Next, battery plus has been started as an endeavor towards a new so-called large-scale research initiative of the European Commission. And our goal is nothing less than to invent the battery of the future. The aim of this webinar is to stimulate scientific discussions along the roadmap of Battery 2030 Plus, which will be presented in the next talk by our coordinator. And the following talks are grouped according to different aspects in our roadmap. We will start with new ways for accelerated materials discovery and modeling. Later this day, we will also have presentations of state-of-the-art methods for analytics. And tomorrow, we will start to look at batteries from a more perspective. Uh, we will hear about manufacturing and sustainability aspects, about sensing, and about self-healing of batteries. I should also mention uh, that we have got many more abstracts than there are time slots uh, today and tomorrow. So there is actually the idea that we continue with another meeting of this kind, maybe in a couple of months. It was mentioned already that the goal of this project is to invent the battery of the future. Now, batteries of the future have already been invented several times in the past, and every time the performance of the new systems made a leap, uh, the price dropped, and the safety improved. Now it seems that there is some urgency to make yet another leap. To get there, we in the consortium believe that our classical approaches so far need to be extended by new concepts. Concepts which are generic and have the potential to discover unknown materials and unknown interactions of materials and devices in a shorter period of time. So we think it may be time for a paradigm change in battery research. I think we are in a lucky situation to achieve these goals. It is probably correct to say that the battery community has surprisingly congruent goals. And the situation appears a bit to me as if the community were passengers on board of a big ocean vessel, which is heading towards new and unexpected. We do have a vision of this promised land, but we do not know as yet exactly how to get there. And we have to find our way through the rough sea and through shallow waters. I'm actually proud to be part of this team on the bridge, and I'm particularly proud and glad to know that we have one of the best captains for this endeavor. And with that, I open the first session. I would like to hand over to our coordinator, Christina Edström. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, thank you for that very nice introduction. I'm, I'm truly uh, delighted to be able to, to give an, an uh, overview of our roadmap, our visions, and what we want to achieve. So I will now put up my little slideshow uh, for this. So uh, just to show that we try to have a long-term perspective in Battery 2030 Plus, and that we want to be a large-scale in research initiative embracing many different groups in Europe to work together towards this long-term goal is really important, and that's why we are choosing this title, European Perspectives for Batches of the Future. I'm also happy that I have, of course, the Helmut Institute at Ulm, and the one in, uh, also in Münster on board, and the French groups, and Italian and Spanish, and whatnot. Uh, but I have a very good deputy director in uh, Dr. Simon Perrault from CA in France, which helps a lot in this journey. And as Max already said, we are inventing the batteries of the future. It means that we go for batteries with ultra high performances, smart functionalities, and they have to be sustainable. 
And we think it's extremely important that Europe actually takes a role in this, uh, I would say, almost competition to have a European battery industry and self-production in Europe, and also to, to have all the, the full value chain of what we need to do to have that battery industry, including research. So um, Battery 2030 Plus want to provide that long-term leadership in both existing markets, but uh, where you know the automotive sector is really strong, but also future emerging applications that we perhaps are not aware of right now. And, uh, and we are uh, decided that our roadmap should be quite, I would say, mission driven. We are trying to put up uh, ideas and, and tools that actually can make the battery to play an important role in where we want to go. Before the COVID and virus crisis, we talked about the European Green Deal. Now we talk about the green recovery that we have to start when this virus is sort of slowing down. And um, of course, we need to sort of fulfill many of the sustainability goals. We can't fulfill all, but important ones. And um, there is also a lot of many important uh, reports in Europe. The AIC are producing a number of really, uh, I will say, insightful reports on batteries for us. And this is one example where they also look at the market, how actually Europe could take an important role for the market and, and uh, have its own production. And that would actually mean also a lot of jobs in Europe and maybe save a lot of jobs that could be lost if we didn't have this. So what are we then doing? Well, we, we create a, a roadmap for this. We support Europe to reach the sustainability goals. And we want to develop European battery research excellence. This means that we um, not only give this uh, um, roadmap to you that you can upload and, and read from our webpage, we also suggest new R&I actions. And this is important. And one important thing is that in, in the European has the set plan, which is uh, the technology goals for Europe. And for batteries, they point out a number of, of different chemistries that will be the future. We claim we are chemistry neutral, but we are transform transformational, which means that we suggest a number of tools that can be applied for any of these future batteries. Can be redox flow, metal air, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but what we really see is important is that we can accelerate the finding of new material and battery materials, that we can handle the interfacial reactions taking place in the batteries, and that we can do that with smart cells in self-healing functionality. And what in, in everything we um, try to achieve and, and our, our groundbreaking ideas we have, we have to make them realistic. We have to think about cell design manufacturability and recyclability. That has to go through everything we are suggesting and doing. And I hope you can see some examples of that during this conference today. So we want to be game changers instead of incremental. And uh, so we, we suggest this Matthias Actuation platform and, the, uh, and we call it also a battery interface, you know, the big map. We suggest uh, the smartness in batteries as sensing functionalities, self-healing functionalities, and there are feedback loops in between these. And we have the cross-cutting uh, topics, manufacturability and recyclability. And um, we have a longer than 10 year perspective. And I can actually officially tell you today that we are actually ending our first preparatory phase uh, now at the end of May, and um, from 1st of September, we will start a three-year period so we can actually try to deliver our short-term goals in this roadmap already three years from now. And we have six new projects that will start 1st of September together with the Battery 20 Plus uh, Collaboration Support Action. 
And uh, for that, we already, as before, I would say, we started this current preparatory phase. We suggested some RNI actions that are actually the project that will start 1st of September. Can't tell you who they are because I don't think the grant agreement is ready for all of them yet, but very soon it will be official. So for the next phase, which will be three to six years from now, the medium term, we have actually, we are in the process to suggest new RNA actions as a function of the roadmap we have. And that is, of course, if we start to develop different theoretical and experimental platforms and tools, we should be able to integrate them better in the three to six year period. And then um, uh, we are uh, also suggesting a topics for something called mRNS, which is a materials RNS. And hopefully, if that is, is going through, it will be projects for 2021 for all of you, open, transparent, fair projects that you can all apply to. Then at the end, uh, 10 years from now, our dream is that we should be able to follow this roadmap and they continue to shape it, to build it uh, forward, to build it for the future. And uh, for that, we need your support, your input, your dreams, and our dreams. And the idea is, of course, that we should be able to do, uh, make the really European battery fit for purpose. That's important for us and for you, I hope. So, quickly, what is uh, the materials acceleration platform? Well, you we need to find uh, new materials ma and uh, material combinations for batteries. And then we build on a lot of strong competences in Europe. We have actually selected our roadmap to reflect what we are good at in Europe. We are good at materials modeling. We have um, uh, artificial intelligence. We have um, the whole master's got an uh, approach, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. We are building infrastructure for this. We are building the high performance computing with your HPC for this. But we have also very strong experimental expertise, which this uh, conference will show. We have um, high quality, high throughput in situ and operando uh, tools experiments with synchrotron and neutron facilities in Europe. And I know they follow our, our work and, and development in the battery area with great interest. Uh, so I think there is a, hopefully a new way of, of actually taking care of all the experimental data we're generating and all the modeling data and marry that together to, to in a way that can teach us more about what direction we can take in the future. Interfaces in batteries. There are lots of different interfaces. Uh, I think in this example from Jean-Marie Tarascon, um, he has identified different, 15 different chemical interfaces in a battery cell. And uh, the properties of these, the dynamics of these interfaces, how they form, how they grow, how they change due to different uh, battery usage conditions and so on, is really not well described. And here we also need to uh, develop new algorithms, but also new experimental tools to really just uh, see this in, in a real, real experiment. And of course, uh, this is something I know Thais will talk about more, that today we are more having a, what I would say, a, um, a linear way of, of having modeling, showing experiments, what experiments to test, and going back to modeling again. And that's a linear way, which is very time consuming. And of course, try to do this in a mere design loop way is of course very tempting. When it comes to sensors, to put sensors directly in the cell, I know some uh, companies are already starting to do that, but we need to do it in a much better precision today to really see in detail when we have sort of the Mm. non-wanted chemical reactions or electrochemical reactions taking place. 
the lot of fundamentals in that. And that comes also into the self-healing part where, where we could uh, try to learn from other fields like uh, drug delivery and so on. How can we encapsulate different chemical components that can tick out and help uh, to, to sort of make the uh, battery electrodes, et cetera, to survive longer, or longer life in battery. And if you put the sensors and the self-healing together, it can be a quite new way of, of, of uh, actually having a better control of what's going on in batteries. And we can rely on them better. In, and hopefully they will be much safer. The important thing here is to do it in a manufacturability way and a recyclability way. So it actually doesn't cost more and doesn't remove too much of the energy in, in the battery cell. When it comes to ma ma battery manufacturing of, of uh, battery cells, we actually can see that we need about the similar tools as when we discover materials. We need also here to describe the processes better when it comes to uh, the experiments on how to formulate the electrodes, viscosity, thicknesses, porosity, um, et cetera. And uh, also here, it can generate a lot of data. You can describe it with algorithms. We have in our battery 2030 plus team really, I would say, clever computational scientists that can already starting in this area. And we have so much more to learn and support with each other. And we have also the pilot line um, network, which is also a project from the European Commission, where we can collaborate. And when it comes to recycling, recycling is extremely important too. And I already said that recyclability will be important for developing our sensors and the self-healing concept, but of course in every respect. And if you look at this uh, graph here, it actually has this uh, roadmap perspective that after three years, we can start to identify uh, hacks and chemistries and so on. But after three years to, to the full sort of um, timeline of our roadmap, we start to integrate the big map concept, materials and sensors, also in the recycling concept. So the first three years will now be some preparatory part for really taking care of the novelties we will come up with in the project. And if you look at the set plan targets, and, and we want batteries with better energy and higher power density that can handle higher charging rates. We want cycle life longevity. We need reliability and safety. We need environmental and sustainability and cost, reduced cost. And if you take all these things we suggest and map them out like this, you can see we cover all the aspects of this, not in every project, but in, in the total sort of roadmap that we are presenting. Sorry. Um, what else? Well, when you have this kind of big projects, you will have six plus a, a, a CSA collaborating to, to make this sort of first three year phase. You need to also work together to develop data handling procedures and protocols for sharing data uh, in a fair way. Uh, you have to develop also protocols to monitor project progress and for publishing with quality and honesty. And that we are doing in, in collaborate with the ETIP Batches Europe. We will also have to look at skills and education. If we have new ideas coming up, we should transform ideas to education. So our role will also be to suggest uh, curricula for the education at different levels. And when it comes to, to uh, different educations in the area of batteries, we have a well-established master program already with the MESC, European Master in Materials for Energy Storage and Conversion, hosted by Professor Masquillier at LRCS. Alistore Erai is very involved in this. We have a new four-year project called All, All Bats, 
which is to include the, um, other kinds of skills which are not uh, uh, not only for university level but also for uh, engineers and so on. And we have the working batches Europe, and of course we have Marie Curie, and etc. And for you who have not endorsed us yet, please endorse us on our web page, batches2030plus.eu, and read more about the research teams and download the roadmap on the same web page. So I hope now that you really enjoy the science that we will now start to sort of uh, expose to you and that we will have a very fruitful scientific discussion the rest of the day. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christina. Um, so we have um, time for maybe one or two questions. I get one question in here. Uh, this is how, bat how Battery 2030 Plus will manage the raw material supply that are not available in the EU in the future. Can you comment on that? Yes, that's an extremely important uh, question. I don't know how who it is uh, asking it, but I think um, that in 2030 plus cannot uh, handle that part. We have to collaborate with Batteries Europe, which has a special working group uh, on that. And that's, I think, uh, one reason why we have Batteries Europe that has the full value chain oh. activities. We are the long term research. We should be destructive, etc. So, um, uh, but of course, it, it's actually a crucial question. It's also a very political question. It's an ethical question. I mean, we see and find more and more raw materials in Europe, but no one wants to mine in the back garden. I can see, especially for my own country, where we find both vanadium, lithium, and, and I think we have some even nickel and cobalt, uh, and definitely a lot of copper. So um, uh, it's not really Battery 2030 plus, but it's Batteries Europe. Yeah, thank you very much. I see some more questions. Um, one okay, question. We can answer this, um, this question. If you have a question, please do not post it in the chat, but please use the question and answer section. We are monitoring the question and answers. We are not necessarily monitoring the chat. I have seen already a, a question in the chat. Please do not use the chat, but use the question panel for asking your questions. Thank you. Okay, I see uh, most of the questions are really done in the questions and answers uh, apart. Um, another, maybe we have time for one more question, and that is from Alok Tripathi. What is the benchmark for energy density? Well, that is the beauty of Energy 30 Plus. The question is, what chemistry are you asking about? Because we say that we work on the batteries of the future. So if you then uh, think of, uh, of a sodium battery, it has to be uh, related to that kind of chemistry. And, or if it, it's the, uh, a solid state battery, it has to do with that. That's why we don't have these kind of KPIs. What we generally do is that every of these different chemistries you can think of, they have a theoretical limit and they have a practical sort of density. And what we want is, of course, to, to press the practical uh, energy density and cyclability up uh, towards the theoretical problems. So actually the chemistry neutrality is the, the tools to help you bridge that gap. Yeah, then uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christina, for this great introduction. Thank you very much for the people uh, listening to us and posing the questions. Um, we will continue with Thais Fegge uh, from DTU, and he will start with an introduction into Big Map and the AI accelerated discovery of battery materials and interfaces. So please, Thais. You, you have to unmute yourself.
We don't. Can you unmute me? No. <laughs> okay, excellent. Thank you, Max. And good afternoon, everyone. I will present the visions and perspectives of the Big Map project, focusing specifically on the use of, of AI and simulational techniques to accelerate the discovery of battery materials and interfaces. As Christina already discussed, traditional Edisonian battery development is simply too slow for the kinds of visions that we share in, uh, in Battery 2030 Plus. So a central research hypothesis for us is really, can AI simulations and closed loop materials discovery really reach the kind of development times that we are looking for in, in Battery 2030 Plus? Today, I will try and, and describe some of the core aspects of the, uh, of the Big Map project, uh, focusing specifically on the use of of AI and, and multi-scale modeling techniques to accelerate the discovery. But it's important to view this as a, in an entirety where you also have high throughput optimization, where you have electrolyte and electrode formulations. And you'll hear more about these in, in some of the later talks today. But a central aspect in this is really the closed loop infrastructure that allows us to accelerate the discovery by integrating input from all of these elements at once. So I'll try and give a few examples of, of the modeling side first, and then try to link it all together in the big map approach afterwards. So one example here is from a recent uh, FET open project called Lithium Rich FCC, where we're developing methods. This is Jinjun Chang and, and colleagues at DTU that have combined cluster expansion methods with Kinetic Monte Carlo and machine learning to be able to predict the accessible energy density in disordered rock salt materials, which are very complex describe. And the reason for this is we really need to use atomic scale information to get the accuracy that is needed to predict the performance of materials. So if we want to predict, for instance, the OCV as a function of lithiation to compare directly to experiments, if we want to predict phase transition temperatures, we really need that very high accuracy. So another aspect that this methodology enables us to do is also to identify what happens when we start mixing transition metals. Can we identify mixed valence states inside the materials? Also give good predictions or analysis of the experimental X-ray diffraction patterns obtained. To continue along the lines of what Christina said, that we're really trying to push the materials to the theoretical limit. We can also use the models to establish structure property relations between these disordered materials and their kinetic properties, such that we can predict macroscopic transport properties of the materials using only these cluster expansion results for the structures. And one way that Peter Janssen and, and Jin-Yun Chang have been, have been using this is try to establish how the local atomic configuration around a lithium atom moving inside the material, how that controls the barriers. So what you see here is a plot that illustrates a macroscopic transport process to the material. And what you see here is there are a couple of red points that represent local energy minima, but you also see the barriers vary dramatically depending on the local configuration of atoms and the mechanism at play. So understanding and predicting how the structure and the composition changes the kinetics is essential if you want to predict macroscopic transport properties. And by using machine learning techniques, we can then identify certain fingerprints or descriptors like changes in energy, concentration of lithium, combinations of cat and anions that dictate the transport kinetics that allows us to describe and predict the macroscopic transport properties. Another essential aspect in, in BigMap is really establishing autonomous workflows. So workflows that allows us without human intervention to analyze, predict, and select suitable materials. So this is work by Felix Bille and, uh, Bille and uh, Ivano Castelli that you'll hear from later on today on using an autonomous workflow that takes materials from the ICSD analyzes not only the thermodynamic properties, but also the kinetic properties in an automated fashion to select uh, suitable materials for synthesis and characterization. So what Felix did is really to generate this autonomous workflow that selects materials from the ICSD based on certain structural properties, sets up automatically calculations that allows us to assess thermodynamic properties at both high and low state of charge, but also to calculate the kinetics. Those of you doing calculations know that kinetics are typically very difficult to get. So it only does the level of, of calculations that are needed. And let me try and show it in another way. So illustrate it a little bit more graphically. Takes known structures from the ICSD, 
automatically sets up the calculations to assess thermodynamic and kinetic properties. And then depending on the material symmetries and the kind of, of transport barriers you detect, you can then run only the minimum level of kinetic analysis as needed. If the electrode material has a reflection symmetry, you only need to calculate the energy of the, uh, the structure at the uh, mirror image. If that's above a certain threshold, you know that that material will not be kinetically relevant and you don't have to look more at it. If it's lower or it has a, a, a broken symmetry, you need to use more complicated methods. But this is based upon uh, work done by uh, Nikolai Matisse at, at DTU uh, on accelerating kinetic property analysis of materials. What can then be done is identify a number of spinels and garnets that have both relevant uh, thermodynamic properties, OCVs, but also interesting therm uh, kinetic properties. Another thing which the big map procedure is really supposed to do is also to automate procedures for, uh, for detecting the unexpected. In this case, it's work by Alexander Thuyssen on on-the-fly analysis and detection of anionic redox processes. So what Alexander did here was to set up an automated framework for analyzing when you have anionic redox processes occurring in the lithium-rich li lithium manganese oxide here by using the oxygen-oxygen distances as well as the local magnetic moments to identify which of the anionic species are active in, in the anionic research processes, analyzing also how close they are to the manganese, how close they are to lithium. And this is not something that's only interesting for, for lithium. Uh, recent, uh, very nice work at, from HIU by Senyu Lee and, and collaborators also look at multivalent electrode materials like VS4 and analyzing then that it is also anionic redox process taking place, combining it with simulations to assess the kinetic properties of the materials. So this is sort of the toolbox that we're dealing with on the simulational side to put into to BigMap. And one of the things that we are really focusing on in Battery 2030 Plus is the ability to control interfaces, in particular interface reactions. But that requires a very detailed understanding of the interfacial processes. Let's take, for instance, the formation of the SEI. We know that it spans a multitude of potentially limiting physical processes. If we want to obtain control of the interfaces and design better interfaces, we really need to have the physical understanding present in the models that we're using to accelerate the discovery process. Let me give you one example of, of one way of bridging these types of, of simulations. So if we start from relatively accurate density functional calculations like up and issue MD, we can run simulations of electrode electrolyte interfaces. If we run them long enough, we also get good statistics so we can predict properties, but still at a very short time scale. If we combine these with other machine learning based techniques uh, with um, Bayesian statistics, we can even improve upon these by identifying systematic errors using approaches developed by Rune Christensen and others or free energy perturbation by uh, Michele Seriotti we can even improve upon the DFT data and then use that data set to train much cheaper machine learning potentials that will either allow us to analyze much more complicated nanostructured materials or for studying interfaces for much longer time or length scales. So if we look at BigMap, the approach is really targeting at integrating AI and machine learning in all aspects of the discovery process. Christina already mentioned, we are targeting a chemistry neutral platform. And the goal is to achieve a tenfold acceleration by combining physical insight with uh, data driven approaches. Let me give you one example of why we believe this is possible. This is work from Will Chu's group at, at Stanford, where they actually take already existing materials and try to improve the performance of those. So by doing machine learning to establish early cycle life prediction, Combining that with Bayesian optimization for optimizing fast charging procedures, they are actually able to improve the performance of existing materials by optimizing the way that the fast charging is performed. So as you can see out here, significant improvements. We really want to push that one step further in BigMap because like Christina already showed, we are trying to integrate information from all the different sectors, all the different domains at once. And by having a central AI that can orchestrate the data acquisition, analysis, and utilization, 
we are able to accelerate this process and not being limited by the sequential process of finishing first the simulations, then running the synthesis, then doing the characterization, but we can acquisition data from all the different domains at once. The central aspect in this is really developing integrated autonomous discovery workflows. So I showed you what we can do for the simulations alone, but here we really want to develop workflows that allows us to integrate simulations and experiments into a single workflow such that we can utilize data from in situ characterization together with autonomous synthesis robotics and run the simulations at the same time on the fly when needed, for instance, to interpret a new experiment or dictating directly a new synthesis condition based on simulations and characterization techniques. So this is really one of the central goals. In order to achieve this, we have to develop a shared data infrastructure and even developing a shared language or an ontology such that we can share data between different simulational codes, different scales, between simulations and experiments, between even end user data. So across domains, this builds to a large extent upon some of the work that has been done by Nicola Ansari and, and colleagues in, at EPFL for developing the materials cloud. But we need to further this to span all the relevant parts of, uh, of the battery discovery cycle. Why do we need this? Well, it's actually an essential tool in bridging the scales between theory and simulations and, uh, and experiments such that we can refer to experiments when that is the best link to bridge scales and simulations. So we can use simulations to bridge different experimental techniques. We need to be able to establish this continuous interflow of data between simulations and experiments across a multitude of scales but also utilizing the different techniques when they're at their prime. In some aspects for some of the models we're developing, we can rely on low fidelity or low quality data. For others, we need the very high fidelity at large scale uh, research facilities. And why is that? Well, if we look at the development of an, of an SEI, for instance, we know that the number of different techniques have sort of their main cost to fidelity value at a certain stage in the interface evolution. And this goes whether it's spectroscopic techniques, electrochemical characterization, or modeling. So none of us would use up an issue MD to describe cracking of the, uh, of the electrode. We need to know when we get the most valuable information from a given source. Once we have that data, we can then rely on deep learning models like variational order encoders to you can say deconvolute the information we have from, let's say, the electrolyte formulation in molecular space, the crystal structure and composition of the electrode, and the microstructure of the SEI, encode that into a latent space where we can identify what we term dynamical interface descriptors, so descriptors that tell us how the interface will evolve. We can then decode that back into real physical space to suggest new materials, compositions, new structures, that will give us even better performance of our interfaces. The last critical aspect is really the ability to, to describe how the interface evolves both in space and time. So we know we have uncertainty associated with the data. For that, we can go to higher level methods to obtain more accurate data. We also know that the models that we use will be uncertain. So knowing when you don't know and when you need to retrain or get new data is essential. And the critical thing is then the models will know when to acquisition data from experiments, when to acquisition data from simulations in order to reduce the uncertainty and improve the predictions over time, such that we can ultimately achieve the ability to do inverse design of the material. So to sum up the perspectives of the BigMap project, we're really trying to transition from Edisonian sequential development to this accelerated discovery using the big map approach. The centralized acquisition and utilization of data from all different domains is a key element in accelerating the discovery process. It requires a, a, an interoperable data infrastructure and these autonomous workflows that I illustrated, if we're going to be able to identify these dynamic interface descriptors that can accelerate the discovery. Like Christina said in the end, we really also need to be able to include input from sensors, include manufacturability, recyclability directly into the process, but this is for the later stages. And with that, I would just like to 
thank the people who contributed to uh, to the work I presented here today and and the different projects uh, for for the funding for the results and you for your attention. Thank you very much, Thais. Um, I think this is quite obvious that a successful implementation of such a work uh, would definitely contribute to a paradigm change what we were speaking about. Uh, so thank you. There have been some questions. Uh, actually, there is a question which was posed in the talk before, but I think this has been answered by your talk, and that was by Arvinda Singh, how important it is to develop standard protocols to report data. Um, I, I think this has become obvious uh, by what you um, have just talked about. Um, then I have a question from Christian Masclier. Um, this is how different would Europe be as compared with the materials project of uh, Gerbrand and Cedar? What's the difference? Well, there are a multitude of, of differences, but there are also many similarities. You can say the materials project have really been excellent in promoting the ability to predict what we could call the theoretical properties of the materials. But like I showed in the beginning, Christina also mentioned, we're really targeting the accessible properties. So not the idealized scenarios, but the real materials at play. And that is really only achievable by this close linking of experiments and simulations. Another aspect, which is also something that is being uh, pursued, is the ability to treat the, the spatial temporal evolution, which is something that really hasn't been done yet. It is insanely complicated and it requires a very long time scale and very dedicated initiative, like the 10 years perspective of Battery 2030 Plus. Then there's an additional aspect, which is the data sharing. I mean, this is a European Union project. There are certain guidelines set out by the European Union for the use of open data and for uh, for sharing and uh, the shared protocols. There are things there that uh, are a little bit different than uh, things are done in the US. But of course, there's complementarity. There's also a lot of the methods that are, are being developed for automated analysis, for instance, that can equally well be used in the US as here. And so there are similarities and, and definitely also some, some special European treats to, uh, to Big Map. But the interface dynamics is something specific here and the spatial temporal evolution. Okay, uh, thank you. There's another question. I think we can have one more, and that is from uh, Raoul Kalle. Um, big Map works greatly with big databases for well-known chemistries of the batteries. But what about chemistries such as vanadium, for which several kinetics have been proposed? I think maybe uh, that's a super good question. Uh, and of course, the more complex your transition metals are, the more complex your environment is, if it's disordered, we are, you can say, embarking upon that route now. I showed you a couple of examples from the disordered rock salt materials where we have looked at vanadium. You saw the vanadium S4 for the, for the multivalent electrodes. So this is something that you can say you, we are embarking on. But the more detailed information we get with new spectroscopic techniques, with new experimental techniques that allows us to describe the change in the local chemical environment around complicated species there, the better we will, of course, get. Uh, but ultimately, we need to have predictive capabilities. If the methods we have are not good enough, we will need to know which ones to improve. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I see there are many more questions, but I'm afraid we have to move on. So thank you, Thais, again, and we go a little bit more into detail, some of these aspects, and um, uh, we have the next talk by Javier Carrasco from CIC in Spain, and this is about computational screening of lithium and, fast, and sodium fast ion conductors. So please, Javier. Thank you, Max, for the introduction, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. First of all, I would like to, to thank the organizers for, for the opportunity to be presenting this uh, work here today. So we focus our, um, our research on trying to find new materials for rechargeable batteries from a theoretical point of view and in close collaboration with experimentalists. 
Um, essentially, uh, computer simulation is a useful tool towards the discovery of new materials in general, and in particular in energy storage field, like uh, Thais have uh, previously presented. By combining theory modeling and experiment, we can nowadays effectively screen new materials, find new chemistries, and eventually design novel devices. So this is the approach we follow at CIC Energy Unit, where we combine atomistic modeling of new battery materials with experimental characterization and uh, electrochemical performance uh, assessments. Uh, from a theoretical point of view, there is a range of approaches which uh, different trade-offs in terms of accuracy and computational cost. We use some of uh, these uh, methods shown in the, in the screen to, to tackle systems containing few hundred of atoms, a simulation box, which allow us to investigate a range of interesting and useful uh, properties of battery materials, mainly operating voltages, stability issues, uh, phase transformations during cycling and ion diffusion. For fast uh, coarse grain screening of large numbers of compounds, the bone balance uh, method can be a, a good choice. So, in the bond balance, balance method, each bond is characterized by, um, by a real number called the bond balance, which depends on the nature of the interacting, interacting atoms and their distance. Um, the key postulate in the bone balance method is the bone balance sum rule. Okay. Yes, requiring that the sum of um, all the bone balances connected to an atom equals the absolute value of its uh, oxidation state. Okay. And the bone balance can be calculated with, the, with this expression shown here in the screen where R0 and B are empir empirical parameters, while R refers to the distance between the, the two anions, the cation and the anion. And both R0 and B can be fitted from uh, known uh, crystal structures. So one key observation here is that the atomic positions of, uh, for which the bone balance, balance sum is close, let's say to 10% range to what um, is expected for a given crystallographic site are regions that the ions are likely to visit at finite temperature. So this opens the possibility to roughly visualize uh, migration paths considering bone balance energy landscapes. Uh, we have, uh, well, in principle, the, the minimum energy required to obtain at least one percolation channel can be a good criteria for establishing how conductive a compound is. And we have indeed automated this process in a program called Bond STR, which is now part of the uh, broadly used full proof uh, suite for crystallographic characterization. Okay. So this allows us to perform high throughput calculations and rapidly screen material databases such as the ICSD, going from uh, tens of thousands of candidates of compounds to few hundreds. Key elements here are the choice of the very fast computational screening method, in this case the bone balance method, and the choice of the screening property to be assessed. In our case, we consider the ionic conductivity, which we estimate from the percolation energies computed with bone balance. From here, we can, of course, narrow down the screening procedure by using higher level theoretical methods before trying uh, more time-consuming and expensive experimental synthesis and characterization attempts to finally perform actual electrochemical tests. But at this point, we can also use the gather information at this level to identify underlying structural descriptors that govern the ionic conductivity of the material. And to this end, we have applied uh, machine learning. But before getting into that, it is well known that the bone balance method uh, systematically overestimates diffusion barriers, which is not surprising given the simplicity of the model. And the scaling factors in the literature uh, for a variety of compounds and structures would suggest that percolation energies 
of 1.5 is a good threshold to define fast ion conductors. In these histograms shown here, um, these, uh, not, I mean, the, the compounds here for lithium and here for sodium will be actually the compounds that pass the, the filter because they correspond to energy, migration energies lower than 1.5 electron volts. So moving on to the machine learning uh, procedure, we first propose a series of simple physical chemical descriptors uh, divided in two main groups, energy base and uh, structural base descriptors. In the energy base, we have um, the percolation energy, the cation site energy, and the cation bond balance sum. In the structure ones, we find things like the cation, cation, and cation anion coordination numbers, the poly polyhedron volume of the cation and the anion. Um, this, one, this one here is the cation anion volume fraction, the density of the material, and the percolation radius, this RP. So these are the uh, Spearman correlation coefficients between each pair of uh, these descriptors for lithium and sodium oxides in this case. And some correlations are, uh, have a very clear physical origin. For example, the negative correlation between the migration energy and the percolation radius is quite obvious because the percolation radius measures the bottleneck of the diffusion channel. And uh, in, an increase of the percolation uh, radius reduce the repulsive forces at the bottleneck, and therefore this reduces the, the migration energy. So this makes the uh, migration energy to decrease monotonically with the percolation radius up to a given threshold, about um, 0.5 Armstrongs in the case of lithium compounds. For percolation radius greater than this threshold, there is no further substantial energy gain by enlarging the percolation radius, and therefore the migration energy uh, stays constant. Uh, furthermore, in the case of sodium compounds, the distribution of different families is more clear than in the case of lithium. And for example, here the oxide shows the highest uh, threshold, whereas sulfides, uh, calcogenides, and uh, allies, they have a uh, lower, lower thresholds in general. So we found that uh, uh, we found that reasonably good predictions can be obtained by using only the following three um, descriptors: the percolation radius, the uh, cation volume fraction, and the cation anion coordination numbers. The inclusion of more descriptors does not improve. The, the predictions. Uh, however, current predictors describe well the initial and the final states of the hoping process for diffusion, but not the transition state, of course. The percolation radius provides some information about the transition state, state since it provides the size of, of the bottleneck, um, which is usually located at the transition state. However, information about the coordination of the ion, of the ion at the bottleneck is missing. Okay. So improvement of, this, of the description of the transition state should lead to improved uh, predictions, but uh, this will, of course, require more computationally intensive techniques, such as density functional affairs, for example. In this regard, this technique can become really powerful if implemented at uh, early stages of more complete automated workflows, like the ones uh, described before by Thais in his presentation, where actual diffusion paths, uh, path searches, and transition state optimization can be performed using DFT and uh, net algorithms, for example. Uh, so what we found is that fast lithium ion conductors have the typical coordination number of lithium compounds, okay, between four, like for example, for lithium like garnet algirodite and six for perovskite and nasicon. However, the best uh, two sodium uh, ion conductors, nasicon and beta alumina, have much larger coordination numbers than the usual values found for um, sodium compounds. I will come back to this later. 
in the in the conclusions part. But um, um, once we have a, a list of screen compounds by ranking of migration energies, we can also try to propose uh, new potential materials by structural simil similarity. So, for example, in our list, uh, we found that uh, two materials with relatively low migration energy, these two, uh, 3D conduct conductivity and interesting theoretical capacities with, with up to two sodium uh, mobile ions in theory. So, from here, we can, well, basically, um, From here, I mean, we, we have identified these compounds, so can it be interesting. Then we can, from here, uh, propose alternative compounds with this general form based on this answer. And in particular, we found that in this particular vanadium based um, material, which was, success, was successfully synthesized by solid state reaction under ammonia flux as a source of nitrogen. The formation of the desired structure. Uh, depends on the reaction uh, temperature, of course, but highly pure uh, micro-size um, particles can be obtained with less than 4% of an acid on secondary phase. And from this powder, a positive electrode was prepared and assembled in a coin cell with sodium and lithium metal anode for galvanostatic cycling. Um, the redox activity of the vanadium 3 plus 4 plus couple appears around 4, volt, 4 volts versus sodium and 4.1 versus lithium. This is one of the highest uh, potentials reported for vanadium 3 plus 4 plus in sodium ion cathodes. And in both cases, there is a low uh, voltage hysteresis, as you can see here, which supports the the prediction of fast sodium ion mobility within this structure. Unfortunately, we can only extract one sodium per formula unit. The extraction of more uh, than one sodium cation is beyond the voltage stability window of known electrolytes, as predicted here by DFT calculation. So, with this, uh, I come to the to the conclusions. Basically, I have shown you that we have scanned thousands of lithium and sodium um, uh, compounds of the ICSD database. A machine learning analysis reveals that uh, the migration energy is mainly determined by the bottleneck and the coordination polyhedron and volume fraction of um, of the mobile species. However, our machine learning predictions is, are not accurate enough to, to yield quantitative accuracy. And improving the accuracy will require accounting for more complex uh, descriptions, descriptors capable of describing the transition state structure. In contrast to what uh, is observed for the lithium compounds, fast sodium ion uh, conductors seems to be outliers with unusual combination of factors, large diffusion channels, and large coordination numbers. And this will imply that the number of fast sodium ion compounds is significantly lower than the number of lithium ion conductors. From the experimental side, we validate with a uh, bone balance energy landscape approach the investigation of, um, of these um, cubicon family of compounds, and in particular the vanadium, vanadium based one, which exhibits the highest operational. The voltage for the vanadium 3 or plus redox couple, but unfortunately, only one sodium uh, can be experimentally extracted. With that, I would like to thank you for your, for your attention, and I will be happy now to answer any, any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Javier. Um, I think that was quite, quite clear, and uh, you showed a nice example where you combine uh, theoretical work with experimental work and, and, and you must prove what you have calculated. Um, this is also part of the idea 
in battery 2030 plus, of course. Um, I have a few questions. Um, for example, uh, from Elise Nanini Mauri, how can the system, um, meaning active material and electrolyte, be taken into account from the calculation phase? Mm. Well, in, in this case, we only focus in one material, in, in the electrolyte or in the cathode. So we only look at the ionic conductivity in the bulk of, uh, of these two, um, two components. We, at the moment, have not uh, get yet into the problem of describing, for example, the interfaces that form between these, um, these two components. So our approximation would be to uh, compute with this technique only the ionic mobility in the bulk of, of a solid electrolyte or um, a solid cathode material. Mm -hmm. This was a challenge to go beyond that into more realistic systems. Okay. Within the framework of the of the big map uh, uh, project, we hope to be able to tackle these issues. Okay. Um, I see uh, another question uh, which I don't quite understand, but I will forward it to you from Adnan Tastemir, uh, and this is, can you explain the benefits of sodium with respect to sodium air batteries via formation of sodium peroxide or NOH within the apiotic or protic electrolyte? Uh, well, sodium air batteries in in principle, if, if they were achievable at this moment, we will have the benefit of higher energy density, of course. But the, the, the main problem, as, as I understood at the moment, is, um, is that the cyclability is not good enough yet. And uh, this is a very early fundamental stage to understand all the mechanisms going on in this type of chemistry. While in the case of sodium ion, the advantage is that, of course, it's not the same than lithium ion, but you can extrapolate or, or gather some information that uh, has been collected by decades, in the case of lithium, to sodium ion chemistries. And from there, you can um, move uh, quickly, let's say. Mm -hmm. In this regard, the only advantage at this moment. It doesn't mean that if there is really breakthroughs in the sodium air, uh, we will have, of course, to look into that. Mm -hmm. I think there are many uh, doors yet to open for working uh, sodium air battery. Um, yeah. There is um, one other question from Chari Abdelwahed. Uh, my question about the toxicity of vanadium. Um, will it be a problem for large scale? What do you think? Yeah, I think any any issues involving toxicity, um, availability, sustainability should be considered. Uh, in this example, I pick up uh, here, it was just, um, let's say, um, a theoretical example, so a very fundamental study uh, from the point of view that we identify some um, compounds with uh, theoretical good, good properties, and we try to validate our, our theoretical model trying to experimentally corroborate that. But it's true that for particular, um, I mean, for, for practical applications, one needs to, to combine all the, all the facets of um, development, and this, this one will be for sure an issue of an in, in this case. It can probably enter in a, in a, in a later uh, filter in the, in, the, in the screening process. Yes, and then uh, it's certainly also a question in which chemical environment um, the metal is. Um, okay, I have uh, to thank you again, Javier. Uh, I'm afraid we have to move on, although we got a number of questions uh, flooding in in the last one or two minutes. Unfortunately, there's no time now to answer them. So would you please, in the next uh, presentations, write your 
questions maybe um, a little bit earlier so that we can have a look at them and select them. Uh, next speaker is Moises Rauchau from uh, Uppsala University and he will uh, talk on a similar aspect but not on inorganic materials but organic materials. So this is about in silico molecular engineering organic battery materials. Please Moises. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present uh, this work in here. I will present our recent uh, developments toward in silico molecular engineering of organic battery materials. Uh, we focus on a framework integrating machine learning evolutionary algorithm and first principle theory. This is an interdisciplinary uh, project that is uh, the uh, already, uh, which is the PhD uh, work of Rodrigo Carvalho in the physics department, also in collaboration with Kleber Machiori, research in the chemistry department. And I share the coordination and supervision of this work with Professor Daniel Brandel from the chemistry department. So organic materials are emerging as potential candidates to break through some scientific challenges uh, in the development of future battery technologies, uh, thanks to a unique combination of some features. First, we have abundant raw materials from renewable, renewable sources, uh, there are some versatile low temperature synthesis, uh, some flexibility, I mean the possibility of integration in a number of electronics uh, as we have nowadays, but come one important property that uh, is the large range of chemical and uh, composition uh, structures uh, that can make, make the possibility for tuning properties of these materials and also uh, much easier uh, closed materials life cycle. So then altogether, it come up and stand out as a potential system for sustainable energy storage. However, there are still a lot of such scientific challenges. For instance, the energy density, which is connected to the battery voltage and battery capacity that needs to be investigated. There are some serious problems related to rate capability with poor electronic and ionic conductivity and also cycling instability with due to these some side reactions and solubility in the organic electrolytes. So there are a lot of work that needs to be developed uh, on these different uh, directions. And uh, we needed to look into the possibility of de developing tools to assess this system. Let's have a look, for instance, in the redox activity versatility of these systems, they basically cover uh, the three main categories. They can come up as uh, any type of materials where the materials will basically change from neutral state to negatively charged state do during the battery cycling. Uh, for instance, in this category, we have the carbonyl system uh, where we basically reduce or oxidize the carbon oxygen bonds. There are different families of materials. Here I'm showing basically the electron activity. Uh, but if you consider also uh, these systems, you need also to consider uh, some charge compensation, uh, some counter ions would compensate for the electron uh, transfer or electrochemical reaction. And this cation can be lithium ion. And then we have the lithium ion uh, battery technology. But also, it's not limited to that. This is something that is important that should be highlighted here, is that you have a number of other possible cations. So whatever development we would have in the lithium ion technology, it would also impact the different chemistry, uh, battery chemistry. But these materials can also appear as any type of materials where we basically change between the neutral state and oxidized state, usually at higher voltage, here is one of the examples for these systems. We have different fused rings and heterocycles that can be played in this case with higher uh, 
voltage, and usually in this case, they work more as a cathode materials. But here, basically, we compensate the charge with some anion. So then you may need some dual ion uh, type of technology. But you can also have these bipolar types, materials that basically are activated on both ways, like conducting polymers or combination of conducting polymers with redox conducting polymers. It is a, a lot of activities going this way. And also you can have either work as a compensation with lithium ion uh, battery or work with dual ion uh, battery technology as well. The point is, if we consider all these different possibilities, we and different possibilities of combining uh, different organic materials, different compositions, structures, and so on, you have a huge uh, materials library. You have billions of compounds as have been recently enumerated. So the point is, how can we tap into this huge materials reservoir? If we basically consider uh, the experimental activities, of course, you can make the synthesis of a lot of materials but you cannot largely explore all these materials uh, feasibly in a due time. So then our view is basically to develop this in silico type of design, combine quantum mechanics, uh, calculations, data analysis, and developing proper data for this system, and also artificial intelligence. In this way, we can basically achieve a fundamental understanding of the underlying electrochemistry at molecular level. I'm going to illustrate uh, in a while some of the ideas behind that. And we can also uh, make design of novel materials before an attempt for the synthesis is made. So this is a very conceptual illustration of this, this project. I will start uh, describing the computational details with one particular example, which is these uh, benzene dichrylates. Uh, one of the reasons is because we have a very good development in housing of solar for these materials. We have experimental data to validate the theoretical development. Uh, if I show here, this is basically the building block for these materials. We have this conjugated uh, organic part, basically with our benzene rings, with carbon double bonds, and then we have the carboxylic units, where we have our carbonyl units that would be the redox active that would control uh, the, the electrochemistry of the system. If we go to the solid state, basically this building block assembled together in a structure like this, where we have what we would call a type of salt layer, and where we have basically our redox activity units and we have also some electron reservoir that is our organic, our organic part. So it looks simple, but these materials are very reactive and it's very difficult to resolve the structure. So there are really, really a fundamental questions in terms of the underlying electrochemistry of these, these materials. If we try to resolve the structure and also during the battery cycling, using experimental techniques that would require sophisticated operandi spectroscopy or diffraction techniques, uh, basically, uh, for the battery uh, operating or basically trying to resolve the different structures for the uh, operation of, of the battery. Uh, this is basically uh, something that is not easily feasible. Uh, our solution basically comes from this in silicon approach. First is to use the evolutionary algorithm where we basically start with some population of the different structures that are fully optimized. And then we basically go on and apply permutation uh, operators that are mutation, heredity, and then we have a different way to select the candidates uh, from this system, and then we move on looking for a hunting criteria. If it's achieved, then we basically have a new predicted structure. If not, we come back. So this is a first module of our, let's say, framework, is to have a reliable way to predict the structure and to understand, and then from there on, try to go in a 
environment that is not very easily accessible from the experimental techniques. So let's take then our case of the benzene dichrylate. We have basically separated the system in these two units. We have the organic unit with our carboxylate, and then we have our anions. In this case, the system is uh, applied for the sodium ion battery, but we have also data for the lithium ion battery. Uh, we have performed the different calculations. This type of uh, evolutionary algorithm can involve something between 2,000 and 5,000 calculations, but nowadays it is highly optimized. So this is our predicted. So you see the experimental structure. This is the predicted structure. We manage to basically predict all different small features of the structure without any experimental input. Uh, including the salt layer and the organic part. When we basically compare also the XRG, we can see the excellent agreement between the two structures. So what's the advantage now? I can go beyond and start with my initial pristine structure and start making prediction of the structure after insertion of sodium ions and the electrons in the structure, what would not be very easy to obtain from the experimental point of view. This is, for instance, the first, the first sodiation step, and then the second sodiation step. These are the number of calculations that are necessary uh, for this uh, prediction. And from there, we can basically predict the voltage uh, concentration profile, and this display excellent agreement with the 0 0.6 volts uh, obtained experimentally. So this is our first uh, framework. We could keep work with all these evolutionary algorithms and try to explore larger materials library. But if you look here, we needed to do, go and work with a lot of different calculations. So we have explored that with different uh, systems showing that how small modifications of our organic units basically impact on the voltage, uh, also compared with some of the experimental work. But our main goal now is to have an efficient way to go beyond, to have something that we can explore much larger uh, materials library. So something that we can correlate and basically obtain from simple or simpler molecular calculations. So what would be basically the correlation between the molecular profits and the materials in the solid state uh, at work in the battery system? For that, there are different ways. We started exploring different type of correlation analysis, looking to the mood uh, regression. Here, we basically would have different molecular descriptors that connect basically our molecular profits with the solid state property. Just to give an example, we have, for instance, the open circuit voltage. In this case, we needed to combine the reduction and oxidation potential. It was not possible to simply look into the reduction potential and predict this OCV. And we basically work both with the ordinary least square regression, but we have also made analysis of this principal component analysis that help us to have a better clustering of the materials as cathode or anode materials, materials with higher and lower potential. So as soon as we have identified these properties, then we went one step further and developed uh, a way to construct our uh, database for uh, predicting the descriptors we have now a database that went to something like 15,000 structures, and we have uh, basically started keeping growing uh, this database. It was important because it was not available, this data in the literature. And from this data, we started developing our uh, machine learning framework, basically work with different representations uh, to predict the structures. Basically, here we have the representation framework. We have a neural network to make the prediction. For the representation, we have a family of different representations, but basically we work with many body uh, and uh, columbi matrix representation. 
here is just to illustrate that the representation is something very important. But just to give you an idea, this is the best uh, framework that we have obtained, uh, combining the representation with the main body tensor representation, some recurrent uh, neural network, and some dense uh, neural network. It, this is basically the logic of encoding, reducing dimensionality of one representation and decoding. In terms of results, we basically have obtained uh, a very good prediction for this system and with different uh, structures. So just to finalize, here is some of the predicted system. And to make a summary, our perspective on the molecular engineering is basically data centered where we are developing different layers of the database connected basically with our uh, descriptor generator using neural net network basically to expand the database and then come with the high throughput. So this is uh, now implemented and made some of the fundamental predictions for this system. So this is some acknowledgement and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your kind presentation. So uh, this is um, very interesting that you can really expand that to such a huge number of uh, um, organics and select it. Nevertheless, uh, I see a, a critical question here, and this comes from Christian Mascalier. Uh, and he asked whether the EU should really push strong towards organic batteries. Uh, because uh, the question is, do they show indeed real perspectives for practical use and long site life? What is your opinion? Uh, my opinion is yes. Uh, if we consider a uh, different system, we have seen quite a very good uh, development, for instance, when we take polymeric materials uh, as a cathode materials, for instance, and also when we think about new chemistries, these uh, materials they can be very flexible to accommodate large anions and so on that might not be so easy to accommodate in these inorganic and especially here that we are thinking about the future and to invent the chemistry of the future these open a lot of different perspectives this is uh, the, the general opinion yeah i think the main criticism comes from the fact that um, organic materials are very light and and then the density is low, that means you need large volumes, which is uh, counterproductive in cell phones, notebooks, uh, cars. But of course, that may, uh, may be not a problem in, in other applications, like stationary applications or whatsoever. Um, okay, um, I do, uh, may I know the availability of the database you have developed uh, from Nagaraj Patil? This question. Yeah, they, we are going to make this data available. Uh, we are now organizing in a, in a good way. So the idea is that soon, uh, basically, we are going to publish the results and make the whole data available. Oh, very good. And, 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 and all this data is very much connected to the battery uh, problem. So we have redox potential, all these different types of uh, properties that are fundamental for the battery application. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it's also a question from Samuel Bertolini. Uh, can those methods be used to predict metal organic framework structures, MOFs? Yes, they have already been done for, for, for MOFs quite well, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, finally, I don't know whether you uh, have an answer on that. What about the safety of the organic system? Yeah, I maybe I'm not, I, I might not be on the position maybe to, to really answer uh, those, those questions, but uh, uh, as I say, I mean, uh, we have a lot of different new uh, papers coming out now in the last two years with uh, implementation of the system, so there are stability issues, but uh, yeah, I... Mm -hmm. Okay, then uh, I thank you again. Uh, and we move to our last speaker of this session. Uh, this is Helge Stein, uh, who is here from Helmholtz Institute Ulm, and uh, who will speak about autonomous feedback loops in experimental electrochemistry 
via integration of automation and data science. This goes a little bit back to what um, uh, Thijs Fegge uh, presented before, and this is more or less a practical approach, how we can get there and collect and uh, work with this data. So please, Helge. Yeah, thank you very much, Max. Um, by the way, if there's a weird background noise, uh, the gardeners just decided to uh, care for the plants uh, a couple of minutes ago, so I'm, I'm sorry if you have a, a weird noise in the background. So yeah, I'm going to talk some about autonomous feedback loops, and actually uh, today I'm pretty proud because uh, uh, from today morning on at 8 o'clock, uh, I'm allowed to call myself a junior professor uh, at the uh, KIT. So this is, this is pretty great for me today. Um, so if we take uh, a little bit of a bird's view on material science, and what we are really trying to do here is we try to do materials discovery, and I see this as an exploration, understanding, and exploitation of our knowledge. So usually uh, when you see this, you can compare this to mountaineering. And I'm a big mountaineering fan, uh, so here you get that example. So whenever you try to do mountaineering and you want to just go to the top of a mountain, uh, you can do this in several different ways. You can either start at a point uh, and just, you know, try to take a lift and uh, go there as fast as you could uh, probably do it. You could take the very long way, you know, the scenic route where you really learn mountaineering and you really go for that challenge. Um, and, and try to, to experience yourself and, and try to experience uh, nature. But then uh, you could also uh, just go and say, I want to go to that very specific point, try it out. If I don't like it, okay, whatever. Now, how could we transfer this uh, type of uh, vision to material science? Well, what we typically work in is the chemical space. And the chemical space is spanned by processing, morphology, the composition, the uh, structure of uh, the, the chemical nature, or the structure uh, of the electronic structure. And all of these things have a uh, impact on our functional probabilities. So what we are trying to do uh, effectively when we do, uh, at least in my vision, when we do uh, material science, is we are trying to explore this map uh, of processing, morphology, composition, structure, and um, electronic structure and uh, try to exploit the knowledge that we have gained, you know, while trying to climb our mountain. Now, for these things, we need a couple of uh, new developments. And what we need uh, very critically for this is we need embedding. This is a way of essentially trying to fit the information of composition, structure, process, uh, processing, and morphology uh, into a form that the computer understands, it, which is essentially effective. And then to efficiently explore our map, we need materials robotics, we need the software, we need the data management. And in the end, we actually want to understand something because we don't just want to, you know, let the robots work for themselves. We actually want to uh, uh, know why they, uh, they think certain uh, well, experiments on certain materials are interesting. And for this, we need explainable AI. And uh, throughout this talk, I want to try to explain a little bit on uh, what our vision and what my vision uh, is on, on how we get there and, and what tools we have available. So, what we all talk about are these, you know, autonomous feedback loops. But in order to build an autonomous feedback loop, you actually need to start talking about what are you actually doing. So uh, to this end, um, John Gregoire uh, and I, uh, by the way, John Gregoire was my uh, postdoc supervisor. Uh, and as I told you, I just started today uh, being a professor. So this is mostly my postdoc work. Um, so we uh, came up with a list of these eight very basic research actions. And what we try to do in a high throughput experimental science or combinatorial material science is essentially that we try to adopt uh, certain accelerators uh, to the scientific research. So in the past, uh, you know, traditional research typically was able to do scientifically super complex things. But where they, what, what usually these, these approaches lack was the workflow automation complexity. And this is what, this is what we have done uh, mostly in the high throughput experimental world um, we didn't go to the, you know, super complex things like trying to fully automate a TEM or an APT uh, setup, but we are able to, for instance, screen uh, uh, thousands of uh, catalysts a day. So what we might need to try to do now, and especially within Battery 2030 Plus or Big Map, um, we need to try to build on these existing technologies where we are today uh, using materials AI, and we also need to build on our existing capabilities uh, with high throughput experimentation to really target those uh, next generation autonomous feedback loops and really try to push the envelope uh, towards uh, newly uh, methods that are really uh, capable of accelerating the pace of which we, at, at which we do research by a factor of 10. 
So here's just a, a vision of, of how I think this, this could work. You know, you have your planning, your synthesis, your process, your characterization, all of these things, um, and they're all accelerated. But the one crucial part that very few people uh, put their attention to, I think this is, this is really the, um, the, the crucial thing if you want to uh, get to those uh, autonomous feedback loops, and that is integration. You really need to start to think about what are the bottlenecks if I, for instance, go from processing to characterization to performance uh, evaluation, do I actually have to send a PhD student or do I have to go myself to another building? Uh, uh, what, what do I need to do in order to actually set up the characterization experiment? And uh, these things, when you start to uh, really focus on them, uh, they, can, they can help you to understand where are your bottlenecks and how can I accelerate these. Now, uh, all of these are very uh, many examples of, of things that you can accelerate and that you can try to integrate. Um, in this talk, I actually just want to uh, show you four uh, well, emblematic examples uh, that we have done. But before I'm going to go do that, I want to talk about the one thing that actually holds this whole thing together like a glue, and that is the software that you need for this. So typically, this is neglected, and, and, and people just, you know, they publish these nice uh, research papers. Hey, our, our experimental setup is capable of running a thousand experiments a day, uh, but nobody really talks about the software. And this is uh, what I've spent my, my, my past weeks on, is we try to really develop the bottomless software-defined lab. And that is, you know, you have your really complex uh, setups with different robots, different analysis tools, uh, all this together, but you're really trying to mix and match everything all the time. So what we came up with, uh, with is essentially we now build all of our instruments and all our devices uh, in such a way that they become served. So in the end, what you just have to do now, by the way, this, this website doesn't work because it's uh, blocked with a firewall. But if you were to go to our website, sign sign.hiubatteries.de, you can select the lab, then you can select the pump, which in this case would be number six. You can tell it the amount that it has to pump at which speed. Now, you can do this with all the different instruments in the lab, and it really mix and match together whatever you need for your specific experiment. Now, the nice thing with this is, uh, if you do this, everything becomes just a concatenation of JSON requests that is super fast to implement and people can really start to get going. Another really important part is also data management because this is, and I believe this truly is the precursor for any data science that you want. And this is work that we have done at Caltech where essentially every data point that we have published within the past five years, uh, you can now trace back all the way to the substrate, who did it, when, when they did it, what was the temperature in the lab that day, uh, and how, what codes were used for the analysis. And um, if you want to, uh, uh, this was a question uh, that I saw, if you want to get started going uh, with some data science project, uh, I pointed to my GitHub here, uh, where we have 180,000 uh, materials images where you can get uh, right away. Now it, um, going right away. Now at KAT, uh, we uh, developed uh, in a uh, group of Professor Britta Nestler, a new uh, program called Cardi Format, which does the same thing, but can also incorporate um, data from uh, computational resources. Now, a really important thing in this is also that you need to be capable of analyzing a lot of materials in a given workplace. Now, for this, we have used uh, something uh, called high throughput electrochemistry, where you take here on the left your very traditional setup of an electrochemical cell where you have your counter electrode, your reference electrode, your working electrode, but you just rearrange things and make a nice housing around. Now, the beautiful thing with this is, and other people have uh, done this as well, so I'm, I'm not the inventor of this, I'm, I'm just a, a user and I'm, I'm expanding on the existing knowledge, um, is that you can now effectively target very, very small millimeter scale regions of your working electrode and perform different experiments with different electrodes. And the beautiful thing with this is, now let's say you uh, try to uh, do an electrochemical experiment and then you move away. Uh, you have uh, used a complex uh, working electrode material, you know, multi-principal uh, component alloy and uh, a really complex electrolyte formulation. Now you move away after your uh, electrochemical experiment, and what you're actually left with is the SCI, which you can directly investigate. This is super cool because now we can really start to investigate uh, the SCI using XPS, UPS, HAIR, Raman, SEM, and x So this is pretty cool, and uh, I'm just going to show some uh, examples of what we're capable to do with this. Um, so this was, again, a work from uh, Caltech, where uh, we tried to explore a, a, a space spanned by uh, six different elements uh, and tried to find really high-performance uh, 
oxygen evolution reaction catalyst. And uh, what you see here actually on the, on the uh, right side are only uh, just about 8,400 uh, CP measurements. What you can also do with this is you can uh, start to do sequential learning. And we've just recently published a benchmarking paper with this where you start and go and you say, you know, every experiment that I do is really, really uh, expensive. And I only want to do the good experiments that help me in identifying a good model and that help me in identifying a good catalyst. Now, if you do this, you can really uh, go for the first experiment, train a machine learning model that then uh, tries to bring, okay, I'm unsure about these, and, but these, these are really promising catalysts. And you go on and on and on and on. And then you can benchmark this. Uh, against uh, uh, certain things. And what we actually do find is without, you know, uh, trying to optimize for anything and even incorporating the bad measurements, we are able to accelerate the pace of, pace of research by this by up to a factor of 10, maybe even 20. Another really important thing is uh, that we need to also have translational learning. And this is one example from optical properties. We've seen this uh, in, the, in the talk from uh, Tate Sager that essentially uh, what we have done here is uh, we, we show a neural net a couple of a thousand of images with the corresponding optical absorption spectrum. Now, what we want to do is we want to try to solve the inverse material science problem here, and we want to ask the computer, okay, I'm giving you a optical absorption spectra. Please show me what the image would look like. And this is what you see here on the right. Uh, you see this nice color gradient from, you know, something very transparent to something very green that absorbs a lot of light. And what we are trying to adapt now is, uh, and people have shown this for uh, organic synthesis, or organic chemistry, uh, we are trying to also adopt this uh, towards uh, solid state materials. And this was a, a paper that uh, I was uh, able to publish together with Alana Sproguzic uh, a couple of months ago, uh, where we actually shown this for vanadium oxide uh, to be possible. Um, another really important thing is um, also that we need to have explainable AI, because um, often, uh, you know, materials uh, research and, and, and combined with artificial intelligence is always perceived as this black box that you don't understand. And we need to do exactly the inverse of that. We need to find machine learning models that are able to explain us what is happening so we can extract fundamental knowledge uh, more rapidly. And this was a, a collaborative uh, a study together with the Toyota Research Institute and uh, the TCRDL labs in Japan. And actually what we were able to identify here, this is an example from photoelectric chemistry, um, was in fact that uh, our predictions didn't matter. But what the uh, neural net really told us was a path or a guidance uh, towards better materials that perform really well. And in the end, we were even uh, able, without telling the computer anything about what elements are, uh, to really find out what, for instance, and this, this is uh, not super fancy, but for us this was great, we were even able to identify transition metal oxides for the, uh, to those that were not. Um, so summarizing, I. Uh, I wanted to show you a little bit about how exploration and exploitation in materials science works, uh, what we need for this, and uh, that I actually do believe we're on a good way towards something like a autonomous uh, research workflow, where we go from this linear way of, you know, your plan, you synthesize, you assemble, um, that we really go to an integrated approach that uses all the data at once. And um, if you want to get in contact with me, uh, follow me on Twitter or write me an email. And by the way, we are hiring, so please check the Celeste and the Positive Storage website and visit us soon after COVID-19 in Ormond Castle. Thank you very much. Thank you, Helge, for this uh, impressive uh, work. Um, I do not see questions at the moment. So, uh, I mean, this is certainly one of the puzzle pieces we need in this paradigm change that I mentioned before. And I think this is quite new. So are there any questions? We still have a couple of minutes time. Well, if not, I, I, would, I would like to pose a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> what? And, 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 and that is, um, so, oh, take figure cannot ask questions. <laughs> but, um, if you're, if you're interested in, in a really uh, exciting challenge, and that is uh, nowadays you read a lot of research papers about, uh, you know, trying to use machine learning methods uh, and they use composition as an input. Um, but in fact, uh, what people are typically describing uh, are unphysical new elements. So if you, if you find a way of really embedding composition or even formulation 
without actually describing uh, uh, what a hypothetical new element would be. And, I, and this is why I lined out the map here. Uh, I would be super interesting with, uh, in, in collaborating uh, with whoever is, is interested in this as well. Okay. Um, as I do not see any um, more questions, um, thank you again, Helge. Yeah. So um, then we have five minutes more time for the break. Um, there will be a survey uh, which you please fill out, and um, we will continue at uh, 20 past three. Um, with uh, the next work on high throughput screening based design and development of advanced functional electrolytes for lithium battery applications. Um, and this session will be chaired by Christina Edstrom. So, from my side, I say goodbye for the moment and we will be back. So, please come back on uh, 320.